My name is Michael Guyad, publisher of The Lead Lag Report. Joining me for the hour is Mr. Nick Schmidt. Nick, introduce yourself to the audience. Who are you? How did you get involved, interested in markets, and trading, and what's going on with TraderLine and DeepView? Awesome. Thank you very much. So I've been trading for 10 years. I, I'm very simple. I focused on price and volume, you know, no indicators on the chart. Price action is the only thing I focus on. I don't know much about anything else. And, you know, I'm honest about that. Uh, TraderLine is a project that I'm very passionate about that I've built with my team. And we teach people how to build structure around your trading process, how to build a plan. And then DeepView is in beta currently and it's coming out, but it's going to be kind of the next generation scanning software is, is what we're aiming for to allow you to find, you know, stocks that meet your criteria quickly. It's interesting. I, um, I've talked to a lot of technicians and I always make it a point that true technicians, they don't care about what they're looking at. They don't care about the Fed. They care purely about price behavior. And some people, when they hear that, they think that's kind of crazy. How can you how can you make an assessment based on just a chart as opposed to knowing the context around the chart? Lay out for the audience why you don't focus on other things. Why just price action? Some people on the surface would say, well, maybe that's just a function of not wanting to learn, uh, but maybe it's more a function of it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's awesome. So I'm a big fan of KISS. Keep it simple, stupid, I think is what it stands for. I, you know, so the more things that I tried to, over the years to incorporate into my trading strategy, the more conflicting signals that I had, it would lead to analysis paralysis. It was, you know, like um, reading chart patterns. This is breaking out. I should buy this now. But, you know, I'm not sure about the economy or I'm not sure about this. And I would always have conflicting signals and uh, it would just lead to analysis paralysis. I was afraid to do anything and, you know, nothing was complementing each other. So what I began to do is just peel back the layers, what's not necessary. And so there's a lot of people that don't believe, you know, price action, you know, you've got to understand the economy, you've got to understand all this. But from my experience, you know, you see what's going on in the charts. So if people like if the if the market's going to go down or the market's going to go up we're going to see the signatures left behind by the people that actually move the market that they leave on the charts so you know big institutions if they're buying or selling they can't really hide it that well and so just by paying attention to the chart you can see exactly what they're doing and i've just come to realize that there's really no need to know any more than that i like i said i don't know anything about the economy and well, you know, anything in depth. And I really keep it an effort to, I'm really protective over how simple my charts are. My charts, like I said, they're price, volume. I use the relative strength line every once in a while. But besides that, that's it. And I've just come to realize over the years that anything additional is just conflicting to, you know, what what I'm good at, the core of, of what I'm good at. So I hope that answers your question, Michael, on, you know, why I focus on price action. I just, I believe that, Everything going on, you can you can see within the charts themselves. Yeah, no, and I don't I don't necessarily disagree. I mean, I, I tend to look at things myself more from an intermarket perspective. So it's price relative to you know other parts of the marketplace to see if there's some information spillover. But the point about conflicting signals, I think, is really interesting for a lot of people that are maybe thinking too simplistically about markets. You will always have conflicting signals, even when you're just looking at price and volume, I would assume, you know, different time frames will give you conflicting messages, different oscillators obviously can do the same, right? I mean, you can be risk on being above a moving average, but it depends on if it's, you know, 50 moving average versus 200 day moving average. So when it comes to your own approach towards trading, how do you resolve that aspect of the conclusion not being as clear? Yeah. So you're right. You know, you're always going to get conflicting signals um, no matter what. So that's why I just try to minimize it and focus on what I have to. So for my system, you know, I'm, I'm constantly checking the industries and kind of seeing what's moving up, what's moving down. I'm looking to see relatively what's holding up and what's not. I have a very specific, I guess, strategy that I do follow that I'm not trying to plug trader line, but we do teach that trader line. I have a very specific strategy I follow that clearly tells us the trend. You know, are we in an uptrend or are we in a downtrend? We've been in a downtrend for eight days, considering, I mean, according to our market cycle. And so just, I just sit in cash and I've been seeing some buying opportunities, but, you know, as long as we're 
in a downtrend for my specific market cycle, I just, I know the best thing is cash and to to just sit. So it, it comes down to a lot of discipline as well. Discipline is, you know, the most important thing. And no matter what, you're going to get conflicting signals. So are you going to have the discipline to, you know, focus on what you understand? Are you going to have the discipline to even follow through when something happens that you understand? So I think for me, I just keep it very simple. And it, I, it's just a discipline of, okay, like I'm getting conflicting signals now, but I have a priority of, you know, what's more important. The trend is the number one most important thing for me. Right now, the trend's not on my side for long positions. And so, you know, I'm not going to initiate. I'm just going to have the discipline to to sit out. So I think this is actually the um, a big part of trading. And I would have a number of these spaces with people that focus more on the psychology of things. But yeah, I often find that discipline and fintwit are very much at odds, <laughs> okay, right? Because it's very yep. hard to be to be disciplined when uh, you get these tweets out there that show some buy or sell entry exit, or you get some macro news and that's really interesting that makes you really bullish or really bearish and makes you then change your your view on your existing portfolio. And I think this is the hard part, right? As a trader like you that's you know more on the discretionary side of things, you want to build your business. You want to be out there. But you also have to be careful not to not to get caught up in the noise of social media while using it to to grow your reach. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So social media it's very, you know, it's a double edged sword. There's a quote that I'm I'm probably going to butcher right now, but there's a quote that I really love and I can't remember who it's by, but it says, stop comparing your behind the scenes with everyone else's highlight reel. And I kind of really like that because, you know, TraderLine is at the end of the day, it's a trading education and trading service. And, you know, that business has an interest and it's to get more signups. And so there's a lot of people doing what I'm doing. There's no difference there. It's just the difference is people like to share some unrealistic things and kind of make trading look glamorous, which trading is absolutely not glamorous whatsoever. So the stop comparing your behind the scenes with everyone else's highlight reel, I kind of like that just because, you know, people are going to selectively share what they want on Twitter. So, you know, if they don't want to acknowledge a loss personally, they might not post it on Twitter and just pretend like it didn't happen. Uh, And so people look pretty perfect and they look like great traders on social media. And it kind of makes you think sometimes like, what the hell am I doing? But, you know, you kind of see the the nitty gritty behind what's going on and you understand the sacrifices and you're only seeing what the other person wants to put forward. So, you know, on social media, it's like you want to take things with a grain of salt and understand that, you know, like every successful trader. So I, I've my business partner, Richard Moglin, he's interviewed tons and tons of traders on a podcast and everyone says the same thing. It's, you know, trading is really difficult. You cannot avoid losses. And they're part of the system. It's, you know, I hear a lot, they call it the trenches. It's it's, it's not glamorous. And that's what I want to focus on. So yeah, when I'm sharing on social media and stuff, I kind of focus on the psychological side. I don't really share too much about, you know, what I'm doing, specific trade wise and stuff like that, just because it's, it's really not too relevant. I think the mindset is, you know, at the end of the day, the, the most important thing. I mean, you need an edge. I'm not, that's the most important, but after an edge, you need, you need the mindset. So I would argue that discipline is the edge, right? I mean, that's that's why it, it, it's, it goes to all those studies that show that you know, a lot of people are very good at starting, but they're very bad at continuing, right? And and the challenge, I think, is that for a lot of newer traders, correct me if I'm wrong, is that their likelihood to continue is a function purely of luck in terms of where they start and what it does as far as their confidence, right? So if you started you know, in uh, late January of 2020, and the COVID crash happens, you're like, fuck this, right? <laughs> right? If you were yep. starting in March, on the end of March in 2020, you're much more likely to stick to, you know, any approach, regardless of whether it's based on anything that has merit or not. So it is interesting, right? The discipline is a, always a function of kind of your, your starting point, starting confidence. And that, I'd argue, is largely outside of anybody's control. Yeah, I mean, what? so that's funny you say that, right? Because it depends on how you start. And so how I got started trading years ago was, I've always like dabbled here and there, but I completely out of luck just bought some random penny stock. Uh, it went up, you know, a couple thousand percent. I made a lot of money and I saw what was possible with trading. And so I was right off the bat, extremely confident. And so I guess I started with a, lack of respect for discipline because 
I was very confident. I thought I had the abilities that I needed. I didn't really understand the intricate and the, the ins and out of the market. I've just, from my experience, I've had success. And so I did lack discipline. And especially something that I tweet often is your biggest losses usually come after your biggest wins. And there's a book that I love called The Hour Between Dog and Wolf by, I believe, I believe it's by John Coates. And I don't understand, you know, I'm not a doctor or anything, but he talks about the chemical changes that happen in your body as a result of, you know, a winning trade or a losing trade and and what happens. And it's so accurate and it makes a lot of sense. And uh, just in case anyone didn't get that, it's called The Hour Between Dog and Wolf. And he talks about, you know, how after a big win, we're susceptible to do something stupid because we have chemical changes within our body. And it's all down to a science. And so, yeah, it, it is a big deal on, you know, how you get into the market and the success you have and your prior experience. But at the end of the day, you know, after I believe, you know, you have like a year or two in the market, everyone comes to the same conclusion and you've got to start looking internally and, and find, you know, what it is that you're doing wrong and how you can fix your mindset and your approach to your trading uh, to really, you know, get consistent results. Yeah, no, I think that's that's well articulated. Let's talk about some of the, um, aside from the, the the penny stock early success, what were the things that you yourself did in, in trying to self-educate? It's more than just kind of baptism by fire, right? I mean, there's certain things that you can build a foundation off of rather than just, you know, winning, losing constantly. You've got to have some, some, information to base your decisions on. So what what were some of the sources you would look to? So my number one, you know, my North Star, the thing that started it all was William O'Neill and Can Slim. So Can Slim is, I mean, I'm not so focused on the fundamentals of Can Slim. I do watch them, but I'm primarily, like I mentioned, price and volume. But Can Slim's, you know, my North Star. It's, it's where things started making sense. And before, Can, so Can Slim, what it's really focused on is like, what are the what are the qualities of a, stock what are the qualities of all the biggest winning stocks in history like what do they have in common and it gives you that and then you know it so the canceling it, it gives you all the qualities they have in common then it tells you you know it's big on following the institutions so you can spot on charts like i was mentioning earlier you can spot you know our institutions accumulating our institu- uh, institutions distributing what's going on and that kind of really opened my mind to like okay we don't have to outsmart the market like we, we, we don't have to be smarter than the market. And what I mean by that is when I first started trading, I, I thought I had to be the first person in, like I was trying to figure out how do I get the bottom tick and sell the top tick. And I used to try to be the first person in and uncover information before anybody else. And that's, that's such a, a losing game. Like just so when institutions are, when, when big funds are buying positions, they're not, you know, placing an order like you and me and, and buying it all in a second. Like they're, uh, you know, it takes weeks and sometimes months to accumulate a full position. So if you can spot on the charts, someone accumulating, then you've got a while to kind of sit and, and join in. And so the biggest thing that, I, so like when I first started trading, <laughs> when I, I got obsessed with the market, I had my big win. I was super confident. I thought I was super smart. And so what I tried to do was I was, you know, it was 10 years ago, it was before electronic cigarettes and everything. In my head, I was like, all right, e-cigarettes are going to be the future. Like I was calling places around trying to get the, you know, special news or something and, and find out like what was going on with laws and bans and everything. And I was trying to uncover something and be the first to uncover it. And It's just such a losing game because if you think of like the big institutions versus myself and like what we're equipped with, you know, I don't have a team of analysts and I don't have all of the the software and stuff to to come to those conclusions. So the point is, you know, don't try to outsmart the market. Don't try to be the first one in. Instead, you can look at a chart, you can see and react to what's going on right in front of you. And you can, you know, hop on and, and join the ride for those institutions while they're included, accumulating. So I guess the takeaway from that, because, you know, I'm rambling a little bit, is when I started, I was trying to be the first one in. I was trying to be the first one to uncover information. And now it's it's none of that. It's completely focused on, okay, what's going on in front of me and how do I react to it? Yeah, no, I, think, I think that's um, well articulated. Are you doing individual stocks, ETFs, what's sort of your your primary vehicle of choice? I just trade stocks, that's it. And do you tend to sort of 
stick to the same stocks that you know, you've had good returns on in the past. Yeah, you always hear that point. It's like, oh, you know, I trade Tesla because it's been good to me, right? And do you tend to be focused on just a select group, or you're always looking for new things? Always looking for new things, and it, that's where you know it comes down to trading is a very personal experience. So it's like there are people that are much better traders than me that trade only Tesla, and it's like you've got to do what you're comfortable with and and what makes sense to you, what makes sense to your goals. Like if you want, if you're familiar, so every stock has a personality, and if you're familiar with Tesla's personality and you are comfortable only trading Tesla, then it's like, go ahead and trade Tesla. At the end of the day, whatever makes money. But for me, what I'm doing is I'm looking at industries, I'm constantly running up on volume scans, and I'm looking for, okay, what's moving up on volume? Even if we have a terrible down day in the market, I'm running up on volume, and I'm just looking to see, okay, everything's going down, what's moving up? And I'll add these to a watch list. And then, you know, I'm constantly monitoring and refining that watch list. And it all starts with volume. So everything that I do, originates from volume. Where is volume going into? Uh, what is volume coming out of? And that's how I track my rotation in and out of industry groups. And then I kind of, you know, select the top industry groups and and I look for, you know, the best setups within those industry groups. And something just to add to is it's really important to, when you're looking at an industry group, if you see one stock that looks really good, but nothing else looks good, that's, you know, the chances of it succeeding on a breakout are, are slim. But if you have that same stock and, you know, three to four other stocks in the industry group also are shaped up and look good, then you've got the industry group behind you and your success, you know, your chances of success are, are much higher than if you're going to buy the lone wolf alone. Are there certain industries that you find are better to focus on than others? And and where I'm going with that is a lot of the work that I do is you know, sector industry related utilities of all the sectors tend to, I would argue, have the most sort of um, differentiated relative momentum, particularly when you're in a you know, kind of high volatility risk off type of type of juncture. But for you, are there are there certain industry groups that you tend to gravitate more towards? Not like specifically. I mean, whatever is up on volume, whatever is moving, whatever is like an IBD top 50 industry group, well, they, you know, they, they tend to be they tend to be a lot of technology and software and you know stuff like that usually those more innovative companies is is what i'm focused on but it all depends on you know the market and stuff usually like i'm really only active when the market's healthy and the market's good and you see those more innovative and technology stocks kind of you know ripping so that's when i'm most active when we have kind of more the safety stocks and defensive sectors i'm not really too active myself if that helps clarify a little bit. Now, you know, I had uh, Richard Moglin actually on a space, I don't know, three, four months ago, and we had talked about some of the stuff that you're doing at Trader Lion. But when somebody comes to you guys and says, listen, I want to learn about trading, about markets, what's, what's kind of the first thing that you would show somebody? Are you, are you basically saying, here's a list of books, here's a list of articles, here's a few charts, here's paper trading to start with? What's sort of the uh, the process that you guys have developed? Yeah, awesome question. So we're big into like chart markups. We encourage people to to mark up charts. I th- I think that you know if you study charts and stocks that have done really well, you can find common characteristics and qualities, and you can really start to train your eye. And I see the pin tweet you have of mine. One of the threads inside of that th- thread of threads is why is trading more of an art than a science and I'm a big believer that trading is an art and it's it's not a science. And I said before, I was talking about something scientifically, but I'm a big believer that trading is an art. And so what do I mean by that? Like, so chart markups, if you do enough chart markups, I did them, you know, every day for years. So if you're marking up enough charts, eventually you're going to be, you're going to see something so many times that it's going to become second nature. So like when I see a stock, you know, if I see a setup that looks like it's going to break out, I'm not looking at it and saying, all right, is this a five week base? Is this proper? Is this I'm not asking myself like all these textbook questions. It's more of like, all right, I've seen this pattern, you know, thousands of times. And so before I can even look at the pattern and say, oh, that's a cup and handle. I've already acknowledged that this is something that looks like it's going to break out. So kind of building that sixth sense in a way is is what I like to focus on because it's super important. And with TraderLine, we don't, 
we steer away from people who are very new to the market. Our, you know, our our best customer is somebody who's been trading for a year, two years, and just they can't find consistency. And so we focus really on that consistency point. And it really comes down to just, you know, unlearning a lot of like the shit that you learned prior. Like we said, the highlight reel, like a lot of stuff that people are teaching is just garbage. You know, making sure that they understand their risk tolerance, um, their goals, exactly. So again, at TraderLine, we don't teach like, you know, this is the best trading strategy and here's what to do and we don't shove it down your throat. It's more of, okay, here's what works. And now how are we going to suit that to your individual goals and your individual risk tolerance? So I guess to answer your question would be chart markups are really big because of the art side. I see Ross is listening right now. Ross is one of my partners at TraderLine. Ross says all the time that like he just looks at a chart and you know he can he can feel it and he'll just buy shares. It's not trading is just, you know, it's very personal and it comes down to instinct. And it, your instincts though, they have to be nurtured. You can't, you know, someone who's five months into the market doesn't have instincts. Like if if you have a feeling that this stock is gonna go up, you know, you probably shouldn't place a big bet on that unless you have your risk managed. But somebody who's been trading like Ross, you know, 30 years, they've seen the, the same patterns unfold and it's the same patterns. It's the same thing unfolding over and over and over. And once you see that enough times, it's like it becomes an art form and it becomes second nature and it's kind of just instinctual. And so that's the point that we like to get people, you know, to. And I guess, yeah, that's the ultimate goal. The point on instinct is is interesting to me. So especially when you're in, in periods like this, right? So I've been hitting on that, that point that I thought March would be volatile, that it would return, you'd have the return of the flight to safety trade, the Phoenix rising. But that, as I've kept on saying consistently, I don't believe this is the credit event everyone's talking about. And part of that's based on data, but there is also an instinctual part of me saying that, just looking at the sentiment, getting an understanding of how severe the situation is and why you can't bet on it. How do you merge instinct with looking at a chart? Because you can look at a chart and all of your rules could say, this is the time to buy, but something might be nagging you right? as far as maybe you shouldn't actually deploy cash now, or maybe you shouldn't actually position. Like I said earlier, like we kind of have our, like my trend system. So if my trend system says, you know, the market's su- supportive of new trades, then I'll do that. If it says, you know, it's not supportive of new trades, then I won't do that. So I always put that at the forefront. So rules are, you know, super important. Rules and discipline, that's number one. So you, you know, you're not going to have instincts and just instinctually feel something and throw all your rules and logic out of the window. Like you need to have structure because that's important. The market is crazy. And if if you don't have structure, you know, you're going to get eaten alive. That's it. If you don't have structure, like you need to create structure. The market has, you know, there's no structure day to day. So you have to create your own structure and you have to adhere to it. So for me, it's like if if I see something, if I see a chart and it takes all my boxes and everything's going off, but I just have a feeling that, you know, it's not working out. If my trend is in a buying, if my trend, if we're in an uptrend and it supports like new positions, like even if I don't I have an instinct that this might not work, I'm still going to follow my rules and I'm still going to place a trade. Now, on the other side of it, if I have an instinct that, like it's it's more of like you know when I see a pattern I'm at the point where I don't have to th- I don't have to think of it. When when I first started trading it was like all right this looks like a cup and handle. Let me Google a cup and handle. Okay, is this five weeks? All right, yeah, it is a five week base. Okay, uh, did is volume breaking out on you know 140 percent volume? Yes, it is. So it's like it, it now it's like that's all instinctual. It's like I've I've seen this. I've this is my bread and butter, and I'm just going to you know follow it. So. Rules are super important and, you know, they determine what you do. And so my rules are at the forefront, but behind my rules, when I'm allowed to trade versus when I'm not allowed to trade, it's it's very instinctual in between in, in terms of, you know, I've just seen certain patterns so many times that it's it's just, uh, you know, you just, you see it and you, you get the sense that, okay, I should probably buy some right here. It looks like we're going to break out. And you know, just it's second nature. It's before you can even look at it and say, oh, that is a cup and handle pattern or something like that. So 
Um, I guess I, I don't really remember what your question was, Michael, specifically. I, I'm sorry, but I think, you know, rules are super, super important with those those instincts. Right. I guess I guess it's also sort of a question of what, what overrides what, right? Rules or instincts, right? I mean, when 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 you're discretionary, you can have your instincts override your rules. In, in my world, I can't do that because it's a prospectus, right? But but I think that's an interesting thing to think through. Let me just reset the room real quick for the meaning mentor. Uh, everybody, please make sure you follow Nick Schmidt. And if you're curious to learn more about what he does with his team, uh, check out Trader Line as well. And this will be, as always, on all your favorite platforms. Yeah, I think I understand. So I don't get too into the classifications of, I guess, like day trader, swing trader, position trader. If you do have, if I like, if I have to classify myself, I'm probably a position trader. My goal is to hold something as long as possible. So I'm not sitting there like I'm going to buy this and sell it next week or I'm going to sell it on, you know, as I'm going to sell it into strength. I mean, it, it all depends, right? Like what the market context is. Maybe I will sell it into strength. Who knows? But my ideal trade is that I'm going to buy something and I'm going to let that trade work for me as long as possible. I don't, I don't want to buy something, ride it 5%, sell it buy something else, ride it 5%, sell it, you know, because there's losses that are going to be sprinkled in there. So it's, it's going to be, you know, back one step up one step back. Like I'm not, I'm not focused on these short-term gains. I'm not focused on any of that. My thing is, you know, like my ideal situation is we have a bull market on the rise. I'm going to get in as early as possible as we're carving out, you know, the bottom of the market. And I'm going to potentially try to hold, you know, until the next bear market until the bull market's over. So, I mean, that's a perfect world. Does it happen like that? No. Uh, but, you know, I just like, that's my goal. And my goal is to hold as long as possible. I don't want to, you know, it's, it's a, being a trader is a lot of work. Like I said before, it's not glamorous. Uh, there's a lot of structure. There's a lot of routine that you have to do daily, weekly, monthly. There's, there's a lot of behind the scenes work. So trading, I guess, I guess I would just say is it's a full-time job and I want my positions that I buy to make my money work for me versus like me working to make money. If that sounds weird, but I do my work to try to identify the best places to put my money so that I'll get the greatest returns. I'm not trying to like, you know, keep scalping and I'm just trying to put my money to work for as long as possible. So theoretically, that means like, what's the safest, what's the most, what's the, what's, you know, the next up the next industry that's going to lead us through the next bull market. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't answer your question directly, but for me, yeah, it's, it's primarily like I just want to buy high and sell higher, not buy low and sell higher. So if you're familiar with canceling, it's buy high, sell higher, not buy low and sell higher. Most people who come to the market, you know, you want to buy low, sell high. That goes back to what I was saying with I used to want to be the first one in the market at all times. I used to want to outsmart people. But it just doesn't work like that. If something's at 52-week lows, there's a reason. Um, it, it's, it's at 52-week lows because there's more sellers than buyers. So trends, the reason why I say my number one rule is my trend system, it's because that's my North Star. I'm not going to go against a trend. If we're in a downtrend versus an uptrend, you know, I want the wind at my back. I don't want to be going against the trend. So... You know, just to finish my point, I don't think I finished about the, for anyone else that's not familiar with canceling, you know, if a stock's at lows and trading near lows, it's because nobody wants to buy it. So like why, if, if you're the first one to buy it, then you had to have come to a conclusion that nobody else on this planet came to, and you had to be the absolute first one to, to discover this. And it's like, that's, I, I love that by the way, because this is what drives me out Fintwit and people keep showing shit that is already not only something you can't back test, but everybody else already knows it has no value. Yeah. Yeah. It's totally, you know, it's, uh, I don't know the, the market and, and it comes also just to, to go back to your point about high maintenance trades and low maintenance. Obviously we want the, the most low maintenance trade as possible, right? A perfect trade. We're going to buy it. It's never going to look back and it's going to clearly tell us when it's time to sell and, you know, we'll get out. So that's a perfect trade, but we just have to take into context, like what the market is. And, you know, right now the market is not, you know, what it was a couple of years ago. And, you know, we, we were in such a long uptrend for so long that it was very forgiving of, of our mistakes. 
But right now, like the market is not forgiving of mistakes. You have to be, you know, much more aggressive. And so I would argue that, you know, most positions right now are going to be high maintenance because you've just got to give it that extra attention and that extra love because the market's a little crazy right now. So at any minute, you know, you just got to be ready to abort and get out and, you know, have the discipline to do so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I I'll look like an idiot on a daily basis, you know, but it doesn't bother me because at like at the end of the day i'm comfortable with my performance you know i at the end of the day i make money right and that's all that matters and there's a quote that i actually really love that i believe it's by ed sequoia and what is it it's like most people would rather understand the market than than make money by ed sequoia i think i think that's what it is and that's super important because most people want to you know understand everything that's going on and i see a lot of new traders like joining the market and they're learning can slim and at the same time they're like commenting on the fed and they have all these opinions and it's like you know there's there's no problem with being involved with the economy and understanding all that i wish i did i honestly wish i did but you just have to notice like where you are and i recognize where i am and to me that just hurts my system because i can't you know grasp it and like i said everything's on the charts so it's about recognizing where you are and just starting, you know, you don't have to try to learn everything. The The more that you, the more specific your knowledge is, the better you're going to be in the long run. Yeah, I think <laughs> ego is like, you know, the worst. It goes back well, to but, that. But, but in fairness, you need, I mean, it, it's tricky, right? Because you need, you need to have ego for confidence. Because to your point, right, you're basically trying to identify something that other people are not either noticing or underreacting to, or maybe even overreacting to. But you don't want the ego to be a super ego, right? To have right. the overconfidence. Absolutely, yeah. There's, I said a while ago on a tweet once, like, you know, most successful traders are humble because they've had their ass handed to them once, like before by the market. And so, you know, ego, I think it has its place. You have to be confident. Like, you have to have, I guess, an ego per se. You need to be confident in yourself, even when you know things might look disastrous. You have to have confidence in yourself and your own opinions and at the end of the day you know you have to listen to yourself so that's super important but i don't know i'm very like personally introverted and i avoid at all costs like you know any ego battles or confrontation or anything like that so i'm like you know the total crazy opposite side of that but i would just say like you know if you're like a mark minervini if you're good like a mark minervini mark minervini is you know he's a spectacular trader and he knows it and he's not afraid to let people know so that's you know, a different story. But at the end of the day, like he means well and, you know, he he knows what he's talking about. So I would just say like most people that you see on Twitter, like we said, you know, don't compare your behind the scenes with everyone else's highlight uh, real. Most people that you see on Twitter are sharing only the good. And, you know, they're just uh, they're very egotistical because from your point of view, like they're not I don't know, you're not they're not doing anything wrong. A lot of people are egotistical because they're either, you know, lying at the end of the day, just lying about their performance or they have a, you know, an, another alternative. I don't know what it is, uh, maybe like, you know, to sign up for a subscription service like Trader Line. So I don't know. I'm just very on the opposite side of ego. And um, <laughs> like I said, super introverted. And I just like stay in my lane personally. By the way, I think that's actually a good discussion point. Also, some people will naturally say, when you have a research service that's a paid research service, I'm going to use the the, the line that you see on Fintwit, uh, that that's a grifter. And if you're that good at trading, you shouldn't need to supplement what you're doing with uh, a premium research service. Now, I've always had unbelievable problems with that line of thinking because I myself have my own paid research service. But it, it's, a, it's kind of a silly argument. Why wouldn't you want to make money in as many possible ways as possible for yourself, with your knowledge, with your experience, with your way of thinking about the world. And then why wouldn't you want to market how good you are through showing your thought process, right? And it's like time has real value, right? I mean, nobody ever does anything for free. In my case, you know, I put a lot of ads out and put a lot of content out because I'm trying to build the lead lag side of things. I'm not trying to make money really on my research. I'm trying to use that to to smooth out my own personal revenue. But it's always interesting to me to see the the almost like vitriolic pushback of the idea that, oh, you're a trade and you're trying to sell a service. It's like, 
why not? Yeah, I, you know, <laughs> I, I hate when people say that. And, but it's, you know, it's, it's a result of like what we talked about. And it's very easy to create a service and pretend you're someone you're not. And so, like, the first thing I'll say is that I'm an entrepreneur. Like, I'm a trader, I'm an investor, but I, I'm very passionate about entrepreneurship. I'm very passionate about the market. I'm very passionate about trading. Like, so why, like, wouldn't I want to combine all this together? So it's kind of the same thing as like, when I hear all the time from new traders, like I will trade better if I didn't have my full-time job distracting me. And I can tell you that that is the biggest lie that you will ever tell yourself. You will not trade better if you leave your full-time job. You think that you need to pay more attention to the market and maybe your full-time job is, you know, distracting you and holding you back. But the more pressure that you put on yourself to make money and the harder it is to do so. So like I said earlier, you know, past eight days for my trend, for my market cycle, there's been no reason to be trading. You know, it's been all cash. And so like, I'm not forcing trades. I'm not pressured to force trades because I'm fine just patiently waiting right now because I've got, you know, another source of income, which is the business. And so when, you know, it's, it's super important because a lot of people think I'm going to leave my job and then I'm going to have, you know, all this time to focus on the market. I'm going to be the best trader possible. But when you need to produce income every single day, the market's random. The market's crazy. You're not going to produce income every single day. Like that's just, I mean, there might be some day traders out there who do it. I'm, you know, I'm not saying it's impossible, but if you have to every single day trade and actually produce a profit to survive, that is putting so much pressure on yourself that you're not going to trade. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to, you're not going to trade correctly. So for me, it's like, you know, when I'm sitting in cash for extended periods of time, I don't pretend to trade every single market. So when I'm sitting in cash for, you know, it could be a couple of weeks, it could be a month, it could be a year, two years. Uh, I've never sat in cash that long, but my partner, Ross, who's listening right now, you know, he'll tell you that you can sit in cash sometimes for a very long time. So if I have those interests and I've got the business, I've got, you know, another source of income to keep the pressure off of me. And as well as I can now keep my focus 100% on the market. So it's kind of like a win-win. I'm passionate building what I love. I'm helping people doing what I do. And it really alleviates a ton of pressure, you know, when at the end of the day, you need to pay bills and the market might be in a in a downtrend for two years. So it's the two things I'll end it with saying, if you have a full time job and you're thinking about quitting and trading full time, just understand that the more pre the more you need to make money, the absolute harder it's going to be. And then the second thing, the original is, you know, why is there such a negative connotation against trading services? Well, I told you, you know, why I'm passionate about Trader Line and, you know, why I love to do it, but like a, a lot of people have different intentions. So that's why with TraderLine, we like to say that we're building, you know, the most trusted trading service out there. And we're really trying to to build into that brand and be the most trusted source of information for traders because, you know, the alternative is there's a lot of distrust out there and, and stuff like that. But yeah, I would say, you know, like I'm a passionate entrepreneur, I'm a passionate trader. Why not combine everything? You know, I'm finding luck in the market and I had to sift through so much terrible information to find that little bit of information that really helped me. So why not make that little bit of information, you know, much clearer for the next person to come around as well. One last question. I think it's very well articulated. Just focusing back on a word you used earlier, which is consistency. You correctly said it. There's a lot of randomness in markets. All right. It's like if you if you can if you can identify an indicator that explains 40, 50 percent of why markets do what they do and accept the truth that the rest is probably randomness and noise, then you're going to be much better off longer term, all right? Because that helps you with sizing and humility and all this. If you have randomness, it can't be consistent, obviously. The only thing you can be consistent on is the same way you roll the die, which goes back to this one. It's, it's the consistency of the left of the equal sign, the consistency of the process. I think too many people, when they hear the word consistency, they think in terms of consistently making 1%, 2% per month. That's not what consistency really needs to be, I would argue. No, definitely not. Like, you know, I might pull a couple of negative months in a row and then, but overall I have like a positive year. So it's not like the market, like we said, it's crazy. It's not like a, you know, it's not a steady paycheck or steady job. It's, it's a, 
it's crazy. I don't I don't know how else to like there's no consistency with the market. So you have to create your own structure and create your own consistency. So Mark Douglas, who I'm a big fan of, and I'm sure everybody knows, he talks about, you know, like how do the casinos stay like if, if casinos are placing probabilities and everyone's gambling, how do casinos stay in business? And it's because like they're always they're they know their edge. They're keeping the probabilities at the end of the day on their side. And so for me, how do I keep the probabilities on my side? How do I ensure that I'm the house and I'm not, you know, the person gambling? And I do that. Like I said, I've, I, the past eight days I've been in cash because my, my signal has been saying that we're in a downtrend. So by doing that and, and listening, I now have more consistency because I'm keeping the odds in my favor. So all like, no matter how confident you are, when you place a trade, you can be so positive and you can have the best looking trade possible, but it's always going to be random. All it takes is one other trader out there with more money than you to do the opposite that you just did and and stop you at. Like, no matter how confident you are when you place a trade, as long as you know that every single trade is random and you account for those probabilities, then you'll start to be much more disciplined and in return, you'll be way more consistent. So just to kind of reiterate for me, you know, the fact that I've been in cash for the past eight days, that's like, I have no edge right now. And so I'm not going to, I'm not going to place a, a bet when the chances are that I'm going to lose. So by me being disciplined and trading only when, you know, my indicators or, or so say to trade, is, you know, that makes all the difference in the world. That's a good place to wrap this Twitter space up. Everybody, again, please make sure you follow Nick Schmidt. Check out TraderLine. Thank you everybody for joining. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate you spending the hour with us, and hopefully I'll see you again.